Oh, we'll try that again. How's that? Oh. I'll just wait for the thought. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Good. Good to see you. Great to be together. Welcome to our service here at McIver Church. For those who are here in person and also for those who are watching online, we welcome you. And if you're a guest with us this morning, a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you've joined us here this morning. We also welcome Pierre Gilbert here again. Welcome, Pierre. <coughs> He's a recently retired professor from CMU, and so we're so glad to have you, and we're happy to help you fill those retirement hours. <laughs> Um, Pierre is bringing us a three-week sermon series on the power of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, and this is week two. Why don't we take a couple of moments to greet each other, whether it's a handshake or a fist bump or a hug, and I encourage you to look for someone that you haven't met before. Let me open by reading Psalm 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. I invite you to stand with me as we pray and then remain standing as we worship in singing. Let's pray. This we declare about you, Lord. You alone are our refuge and our place of safety. You alone are our God, and we trust you. God, we are here to worship you this morning, and we praise you for who you are, creator, redeemer, and friend. May our praises bless you, and may we be encouraged in our walk with you through this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. to 
fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear your thoughts to hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of Storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. that you've given us uh, the weapon of worship. We, we don't make war like the wars around us. You've given us worship as our melody. And so you've given us also the name of Jesus that is powerful, more powerful than every other name. And you've placed all the authorities under his feet. And so we declare now what a beautiful name it is, what a wonderful and powerful name it is. And we thank you for that. Now revealed in you are Christ, 
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is!
chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. You have no rival, no equal. You may be seated. I'm going to call the ushers forward now to uh, to accept our off to accept the offering, and I will pray for the offering as well. God, thank you for being so good to us and worthy of our praise and worthy of our gifts. Your gifts, the things that we give to you, are are worth giving to you because you are good. You are good to us. You are good to the world. You made a good world. For all these reasons, it is good to give back to you in our time and in our talents and in our finances and in our other resources. Thank you for being so good and for being worthy of, of us giving back. Amen. This next song is going to be new to McIver. Um, I after hearing Pierre's sermon last week, yes, ushers, you may come forward. After hearing Pierre's sermon last week, I thought this was just perfect. Jesus, strong and kind, is a testament to the power of Jesus, as Pierre was speaking about, and how it is exercised for our benefit. Let's sing together, Jesus, strong and kind, as you feel able. Run to Jesus, Jesus. 
Jesus strong and calm. Jesus said if I am lost he will come to me and he showed me on that cross he will come to me for the Lord is good and faithful he will keep us day and night we can always run to Jesus Jesus strong Kids are dismissed for preschool playtime and we need an adult to sign them in. Um, a few items of community news. This Tuesday we have our 55 plus walk and talk. It starts at 9.30 at the church and you are welcome to join us. We suggest you bring a mug of your own to use. We do have disposable ones if you don't have one, um, but just in an effort to keep the garbage at minimum. Also, if you wanna bring a snack to share, it should be something that doesn't require a plate or a fork, please. Um, Rodney will be sharing about the work of Harvest that is happening at our church, and so there's a lot to share. It has really grown over the last years, and so he's gonna be sharing about what Harvest is all up to. There will be a spring congregational meeting on May the 5th after church. So we wanna take some time to gather together, hear from committees and hear how their ministries are going. And also just, uh, we wanna share stories of how we have seen God at work among us and we wanna celebrate that. So there's more details to follow, but save the date, May 5th after church. Uh, last week, we voted in um, a new staff arrangement, which will include John and Lynette Clausen joining us on May 15th. They are looking for housing. Uh, they are looking to rent um, initially, an ideally a three bedroom townhouse or house. So if you have any leads on something like that that's close to the church, uh, please talk to me and I can pass that information on to them. 
there are opportunities to help out at Harvest Manitoba, the program that we run here. So if you want to take a closer look at the details of that, check your weekly email and talk to Rodney. Tamira Weeb has been um, planning some social activities for us. Last year, you may recall, we had a garden tour in the summer, and that was a big hit. She has another one planned for July, but before that, May 26th, um, she's organizing a hobby show. And I'm really excited to see what kind of hobbies um, are amongst this group. So talk to Tamira if you want to share what it is you do with your free time. And I'm sure there will be some surprises among us. I always find it interesting to hear what kinds of things interest people and what they give some of their time to. All right, so let's take some time to pray. And um, yeah, you can stay seated, but I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Lord, this we declare about you. You alone are our refuge, our place of safety. You are our God, and we trust you. God, we marvel at how well you know us and how deeply you care about each one of us. You know our needs, and you know our hearts. This morning, we are gathering to worship you together as a church community. We also worship you when we are serving you. And so may we serve you well by caring for others, by sharing your good news, and by being light in our community. God, we pray for all of those who come through our doors to participate in the Harvest Program. May they receive nourishment for their body and also for their soul. And Lord, we pray for those who are attending or working at Razorback Daycare. May you protect the children, give wisdom and compassion to the staff, and may they enjoy a harmonious and safe environment. Lord, in our own church family, we recognize that people are in different places or seasons in their lives. For those who are struggling, May you bless them and provide for them. May the lonely receive a friend. May the needy be provided for. May the frustrated or discouraged receive encouragement. May the grieving receive comfort. And may the sick receive healing. And may the spiritually hungry receive nourishment. God, as we look to the future, we pray that you would guide our church Lead us on the path that you have for us, and may we commit ourselves to prayer for our church and its work. We pray also for the community around our church. May we be a light and point to you, the source of the light. And God, we pray for John and Lynette, Andrew and Bennett, as they prepare to move and begin ministry at McIver. You know the big changes that lie before them, finding housing, settling in, meeting new people, and starting a new job. God, would you bless them with your peace, and may their transitions go smoothly. Lord, this we declare about you. You alone are our refuge, our place of safety. You are our God, and we trust you. Amen. I invite Grace to come and give us a scripture reading. this morning is taken from Revelations 5 verses 1 to 14. Revelations 5 and if you want to follow in your pew Bible it's page 952. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and outside of the scroll and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who's worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He's worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. 
Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands Thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang blessing and honor and glory and power to the one who's sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, good, pe <laughs> good people of MacIver. It's good to be here. Uh, before I say anything else, I really would like to encourage you all to pray for the, uh, for the extremely volatile situation that we are experiencing in the Middle East right now. And if you think of it, um, and I'm saying that uh, because I personally know many Jewish people here in Winnipeg, and it's difficult for them also. Uh, there's a rise in anti-Semitism, and uh, it's, uh, it's been very difficult for, for them. You know, they're just ordinary people. They have nothing to do with what's going on in the Middle East, but there's a fair amount of concern there. So if you think of it, I really encourage you to pray that our God will intervene and, and bring peace again. I also want to remind you that uh, I have created a website, and uh, it, the handle is pierregilbert.net, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. I will be uh, sending, you know, I'll be subscribing people to it uh, in a little while, and uh, I hope to put new content every week. And the one thing I'd like to bring your attention to is a series on the creation narrative that I've been publishing for the MB Herald in the last few months. I think it's, uh, I have four published. There's a fifth one they're supposed to put up, and I don't know how many I'm going to put up there. The MB Herald told me they were uh, open to having as many as I wish to publish. So we'll probably go up to 50, 100, 150. <laughs> And I think you will enjoy them as well. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the privilege of doing this three-part series on the power of Jesus Christ uh, out of the uh, Gospel of Mark. I want to thank Kim for extending this invitation to me. I've had the privilege to know Kim for many years. And as a student at CMU, a great student, in fact, and also as a fellow servant of uh, the kingdom of God. And so I want to wish her uh, God's blessings as she continues to serve our Lord here in this community. So welcome to the second of this uh, series of messages on the power of Christ. This message is based on Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, and it highlights the power of Christ over radical evil. And so today's message will answer, or attempt to answer, five questions. The first one is, why does Jesus make a point of going to a pagan territory to face uh, what must have been probably one of the worst cases of uh, demon possession ever? 
Number two, does this text provide a demon casting recipe? All right, so that's the second question. Some people think it does. Number three, and that's really the big question, especially for Mennonites who like farmer's sausage. <laughs> that's the big question. Why does Jesus allow de demons to go into the pigs, and why do they run into the sea where they die? That's a lot of farmer's sausage. <laughs> I weep every time I read this text. <laughs> How many demons does it take to control a pig? And <laughs> that's not my fault, I'm French. And, um, and what is the central message of this particular text? That's what we're gonna get to in the conclusion. And next week we'll look at Mark chapter 15, 38 to, the, to 39, where we deal with the, uh, the, the tearing or the rendering of the uh, temple curtain. Um, if you are interested in knowing a little bit more about the approach that I have adopted towards the demonic, an approach that's been well received, in fact, uh, in, in many uh, traditional cultures. Uh, I know Haiti, it's been well received, and some African countries as well. I would encourage you, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, you can go, I encourage you to take a look at this book. I have a few copies for sale. I sell them basically not at loss, I mean, I am, a French Mennonite, I saw, but uh, at cost, you know? So 10 bucks, it's yours. Or a promise even of $10, I'll take it. <laughs> it's, I, I can sign them, so if I die in the next couple of weeks, it should raise in value. Okay, so maybe, maybe I'm a little bit too simplistic and I'll leave that up to you, but it seems to me that increasingly, um, uh, the Christian community is being divided into two, two communities. Uh, uh, there are two kinds of Christians increasingly. There are those who see themselves as basically puttering around in a vegetable garden in a quiet suburb. They tend to focus on things like, uh, you know, where to plant the carrots and the peas and the tomatoes. They worry about sunlight and shade and water and so forth. And then there are those who see the church as an organization that is right smack in the middle of a spiritual war in which the eternal souls of men and women are at stake. Now, I think there is some overlap, but I think as time, as, as, the, as the spiritual war we're in continues to become, to increase in severity and intensity, I think we're going to see a greater distinction between these two communities. The first group tends to preoccupy themselves with secondary issues. The, um, the second group uh, are people who realize that they need to give their lives in service for Jesus Christ. And I would say that increasingly the main contention between the two groups focuses on who Jesus Christ is. The issue of Christology comes back with every single generation. It doesn't miss. So the first part is who Jesus Christ is and what the nature of his work is among men and women. The first group upholds increasingly a theology or an ideology that's become virtually undistinguishable from what we find in the dominant culture. The second group believes in Jesus, the savior of the world, and live with the profound conviction that men and women need to be redeemed. That's our first and primary problem. We all need redemption, we all need salvation because we're all sinners. That's the first thing. They also believe that men and women can be transformed and they also believe that the church can have an impact on society. And I'm starting to produce articles about the cultural witness of the church, which will also be on my website. Now, in order to get a renewed vision of the transforming power of Jesus Christ, we are going to take a look at a text, Mark 5, 1 to 20, which describes an encounter between Jesus and a demon-possessed man.
Now, to really get the point of the story, we need to keep in mind this one fact. Mark is writing to a pagan audience. <clears throat> Not only pagans, right? There are Jewish people in that community as well. But I would say a predominantly pagan audience uh, that was uh, preoccupied with the demonic. In fact, a lot of these people were terrorized by demons and the possibility of being infected by demonic powers. And we get a bit of a window uh, of that phenomenon in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 11, and so forth. So just to clarify matters, Mark 5, unlike what a, pe a lot of people have said, is not an exorcism story. It's not designed to teach us how to cast demons out. They had a lot of recipes to do that. The last thing these people needed was just another recipe to cast demons out. Mark's agenda is a lot broader than that. So this is not a story about how we are to chase demons. It is a story, it's a focus that's important. It is a story about the power of Jesus Christ and the intrinsic powerlessness of demons. All right, so let's begin with verses 1 to 5. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerizines, so it's pagan territory. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, Jesus' appearance is no accident here. Jesus shows up here, at this place, at this time, because there is a man who has a great need. It provides an opportunity to demonstrate God's saving power and love for all. You see, you can claim all day long that Jesus has overwhelming power. That's one thing. Anybody can claim anything, right? But the important thing is to prove it. How do you prove that Jesus, in fact, has overwhelming powers? Well, you prove it by taking him out of his neighborhood and putting him face to face with the worst case of demon possession imaginable. Now, you have to note that the expressions that are used to describe this man are also compatible with the notion of madness in ancient times. It seems to me, I'm not sure, but I think ancient people had the ability to distinguish between demon possession and uh, mental illness. And so here there's a possibility, some people might have said even back then, that uh, this man was simply mentally ill. And so here are the expressions that are used to describe that. He runs at night. That's not normal unless you're some kind of an athlete, uh, you know, training for a marathon of some kind, which is something you'll never see me do. He sleeps in a cemetery, right? That's again, if you've got a friend who likes to sleep in a cemetery, get some help, okay? He rips his clothes off, and he's not on his honeymoon, may I point out. He's self-destructive, he mutilates himself. The opening of that chapter proclaims a most heartening truth. It states, it screams that God's love and offer of salvation is not limited to a particular class of people. It is not limited to a particular group of people. The worst sinner, the most <clears throat> messed up person you can imagine is the object of God's love, attention, and intervention. 
The man, I want you to note again, the man lived in a pagan territory where you would not expect the Jewish God to intervene. It was a common belief at the time that the gods kind of stayed over their own territory and would not bother getting out of that territory most of the time. So here's Jesus Christ, the representative, God's representative, going into a pagan territory and <clears throat> looking to help this poor soul. Verses 3 to 5 communicate the extent to which a human being can be affected by evil. <clears throat> this man is alienated from himself. He is alienated from his family and is alienated from his community. He is totally out of control and no one can do anything for him. In fact, they don't want to do anything for him. The best they do is kind of isolate him there, out there in the cemetery where there's nobody anyways and keeping, keep him in chains. Verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. At the mere presence of Jesus, the moment Jesus sets foot on the shore, this man, I want you to notice that, this man who's proven to be completely out of control, this man regains a measure, a significant measure of control. Mark mentions four actions that suggest as much. First of all, he sees Jesus. You would not expect this guy to see much. All right? He sees Jesus. He notices Jesus. Second, he runs to Jesus. That is very unexpected because if this man is really demon-possessed, the last thing the demons would allow him to do is, in fact, running to Jesus. If anything, they would try to get him to run away from Jesus. He falls in, in, on his knees in front of Jesus Christ, and as verse 7 tells us, he shouts at the top, of his voice. He screams for help in the best way he can. So verse 7, he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. There's a lot going on in that uh, exchange that I won't take time to talk about, but just trust me, it's complicated. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, hey, what's your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Now, the expression, son of the most high God, underlines the utter powerlessness of these demons in the presence of Jesus Christ. The lie, because it was a lie that these beings had overwhelming powers over human beings, is being unraveled. This is an old lie that's been as long as human beings have existed and have believed in demonic creatures or spirits, and the belief was that these creatures had overwhelming powers over them. This was a lie that Mark here, by telling by narrating this event is unraveling right in front of them. The reality is and was that this was game over the moment Jesus set foot on the shore and the demons knew it. These creatures, ladies and gentlemen, are reduced to negotiating the terms of surrender. This is not an amnesty. These creatures know that they've been completely conquered and that the best thing they can do is simply surrender to Jesus Christ. And all they're doing now is, is negotiating the best terms they can possibly get. And that's a very important point for Mark to make. You see, as I said, the men and women of that time believed that demons had inherent and overwhelming powers. Powers they could use against anyone, anytime, anywhere. There's a kind of a form of fatalism that these people experience, and we're seeing that again in our society as we become more and more secular and as, as the Judeo-Christian worldview begins to fade. We're seeing a rise in fatalism and determinism. So Jesus asks its name. 
And not so much to gain control, as some have suggested, over these beings, but to demonstrate the extent to which this man had come under the control, the influence of these beings. Now, we don't know how he got there, right? That's not important for Mark. All Jesus is trying to say is, is trying to demonstrate is how much this man had, the extent to which this man had come under the control of these beings. And of course, the demon answers, and in, in answering so quickly, he demonstrates, or they demonstrate, that Jesus has authority, pure, absolute authority over them. Verse 11, this is where it gets uh, interesting. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside, <clears throat> and the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And so he gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. The first thing that Mark tells us is that the range of freedom that these beings, these creatures have, is very, very limited. In fact, note that they need permission to enter into the pigs. It's not something that they could do on their own authority. They had to get permission from Jesus Christ. Now, that's a good thing because imagine the damage demons could do if they could, in fact, possess animals at will, right? If that was the case, we'd have to be constantly exercising our, our cats, uh, our dogs, our cows. You know, if you're a farmer, you'd have to have a full-time guy just, uh, you know, exercising animals all the time. Your little toy poodle, which to me seemed like they're demon-possessed at the best of times. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's the exception. Have you ever seen these little toy poodles? They're really aggressive. It's scary. They weigh like three and a half pounds, but boy. Uh, can you imagine if one of those, you know, was, you know, demon, demon possessed at night sometimes? They would jump on your bed and tear your throat open. And uh, I mean, it, it, it makes no sense, right? I mean, no, animals cannot be demon possessed. It's not something that they can normally do. This is a one time case. Okay, so they, they, Jesus gives them permission to enter into the pigs for a very specific reason, which we'll see in a minute. So the text does confirm the existence of such evil disembodied spirits, but Mark tells us that their power is extremely limited, which is something that these, you know, his pagan audience needed to hear. I want you to note a number of things here. First of all, we're talking about a legion of demons, a number between four and 6,000. I'm choosing 6,000 here. I think it's probably the better number. But I want you to note that if, in fact, this man was possessed by 6,000 demons, that's a lot of demons per square inch. If I only had one, I'd be screaming out of here and running into the street, hoping to leave it behind, all right? Just one would freak me out. This man had 6,000 of them. Please note that 6,000 demons are not sufficient to completely strip this man of his dignity. Do you understand that? 6,000 demons are not sufficient to strip this man of his dignity. They could not keep him away from Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. Number two, Mark answers, provides the answer to an old riddle. I'm sure you've never asked, but I did when I read this text. How many demons does it take to control a pig? Well, you do the math, right? So you got 6,000 demons, 2,000 pigs, you pull out your calculator, and that gives you, on average, uh, three pigs or three demons <laughs> to control one pig, right? Three demons to control one pig. Well, in fact, we know that it takes more than three to control one pig because even then they don't succeed. Pigs are not built to sustain that kind of an invasion. And so as soon as the pigs invade, I mean the demons invade the pigs, they freak out, jump into the lake and drown. They cannot handle it. Now, I, I realize that the whole pig incident may seem a little bit strange, 
But it was important that it happened this way. For how else would people know that this man was really under the influence of demonic powers? Right? They could have just said, well, he's just mad, like he's just mentally ill, that's all, right? So there had to be some empirical proof that this man was indeed under the influence of demons, and there had to be empirical proof that Jesus Christ had the power, overwhelming power, over demonic powers. Because you see, if you didn't have that, it would have been easy for people to say, even people reading the Gospel of Mark, to say that Jesus was just a good psychologist, right? That he was a kind of a, a Dr. Phil on steroids. No. The fact that the pigs are possessed by these demons and run into the lake and are drowned is the proof the proof positive that this man was indeed possessed by 6,000 or a legion of demons. And that is the evidence that even demons, I don't care how many you, you put together, cannot stand in the presence of Jesus Christ. All right, verse 14. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in town in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, notice, sitting there, he's dressed now, and in his right mind. The response is puzzling. They were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and they also told them about the pigs. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. Now, it's interesting that Jesus' problem-solving intervention did not meet with the grateful response one would normally expect from the community, right? It's a little bit odd, if you ask me. That the demoniac is sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, in full control of himself, is irrelevant to these people. The village idiots, as I like to call them, are very upset by the economic cost of this good deed. They want Jesus to leave. They would have preferred to see the demon-possessed man remain in his miserable condition than to see him saved. At the cost of a herd of pigs per man, salvation is prohibitively expensive. In other words, what they're saying to him is, you're not going to save anybody else here, Jesus. Please leave, right? We've had enough. You see, the village idiots, they don't get Jesus. They never do. I hope some of us can recognize ourselves in the village idiots. It's Mark's way of reminding us of a very sobering truth. You see, there is one thing. Now, Jesus is God. Jesus represents God. Jesus has the power of God. But there is one thing that God will not extend his control over. And that is human beings themselves. God will not violate our free will in order to have us come to him. We have absolute freedom in the presence of God. It's a great thing, but it's also a terrifying thing. As for the man, he's back to normal. He's no longer mad. The redemption brought by Jesus affects every aspect of this man's life, spiritual, mental, physical, and social. And moreover, like all every man and woman who has given his or her life to Jesus Christ, that man is given a new identity, a new reason to live. I can testify to that myself. He has become God's partner. Verse 18, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus didn't let him, but said, Go home to your people 
and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. He became an evangelist. He became a, a witness to the power of Jesus Christ. And all the people were amazed. So Jesus does leave, but not as a concession to the village idiots, but because his mission there was completed. Which reminds us that Jesus is always in control of his fate and his mission. You see, the man wishes to go with Jesus, but Jesus doesn't let him. You see, when the village idiots come back to their senses, right, there will be questions. There will be an inquiry, a, an investigation, perhaps a royal commission of some kind about the man who was healed and the man who damaged the local economy. So this man must return to his community, his family, and stay behind. Why? To witness to the truth of what really happened to him. There was going to be disinformation, you've heard that, and misinformation. You got to keep that guy behind to fight misinformation and disinformation. Okay. Now, the conclusion. What is this text all about? There are two fundamental truths that this story reveals. Those are truths. The world, and I use the term here in the way that the Apostle John uses it in his gospel, those are truths the world has and is still attempting to hide at all costs. That's what secularism has done in our own society. It's hiding those truths. For were we to see them plainly, they would transform every person that comes into contact with them and in time transform the world. Truth number one, no one is beyond the reach of God. Regardless of what evil has done to human being, regardless of the extent to which a man or woman has given himself or herself to evil, regardless of the grip evil may have on a person. God has an infinite ability to reach into the human soul and bring redemption. No one, and I speak from my own experience, no one is beyond the reach of God, absolutely no one. That's truth number one. Truth number two, we are free. Here's the second truth that, as far as the world is concerned, must never come to light. Here's the truth that countless human ideologies forever seek to hide from us. Here's the truth that intellectual elites tell us is a lie, at best an illusion. And that truth is, we are free. Regardless of what life has thrown at us, we are free. We're free to turn to God and be healed. No demon, no degree of evil, no amount of abuse, nothing can keep us from turning our face to God and cry for help. The biggest lie is that we cannot never accept and believe that lie. We can. Hope can shine in the darkest of places. But here's the warning that this text has for us. There's only one thing that stands in the way of our redemption. And that one thing, it's a great gift that God has given us. That one thing is our own free will. Christ, Jesus Christ can overcome all obstacles except one, our unwillingness to accept his invitation. And as just been said in Hebrews 3, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. God bless you.
Merci, Pierre. Thank you for, um, for that reminder of the powerful God we serve, awesome and amazing God. And so I invite you to stand for our song of response, How Great Thou Art. Thanks, team, for leading us in song. Thanks, Pierre. And thanks to everyone else who's had a part in our service. Uh, the kids can go to Sunday school after the service. They can meet Monica at the doors over there. The benediction this morning is this. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. 
May the Lord of peace himself give you this peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Have a great